Yes. We're making them go away entirely. We do like them around. We just don't want them eating everything. So we're going to talk about how we can deal with uh, our, our various pests here in the Prescott area, in northern Arizona in general, really. This year was the year of the bug. <laughs> I don't know what happened, but it seemed like everything cranked it up to 10 this year, especially this spring. It was pretty bad. We got hit harder with grips than we normally do. I mean, grips come out every year. We got hit harder. They were attacking things they don't normally get into. They were attacking with a severity that is, is worse than normal. And then before they were through, the aphids came out. And then the spider mites hit harder than we've seen. <laughs> so definitely this seemed to be the year of the bug. So we're going to talk a lot about how to deal with uh, many of these common issues in our area. Uh, We'll also cover peach tree borers, some uh, grape leaf skeletonizers, and uh, a few other things that are very common here that we have to deal with. Codling moss will be covered. These are things, again, when you try to attack the situation when it's already happening, you don't get much done. The damage is done. You really want to use preventative methods. You know what's going to attack you before it attacks and be ready for it. If you have peach trees, if you have pet fruits, you know you, you need to be watching out for that peach tree more. It's just something you want to be thinking about. So these are, these are things we're going to cover. So we'll go ahead and start. Uh, because we're going into fall time, this is a, a great time to be thinking about these things because a lot of them are going to attack, say January, February, March. That's when a lot of these things are going to be happening. So let's get ready now, be armed with knowledge and be ready for them. So we'll start with a lot of the things that are going to be attacking real early in the year. What's happening right now is that insects all over are mating and laying eggs. That, that's what they're doing in the fall time, late summer to fall. That's what they're doing, they're laying eggs. They're getting ready for the next generation for next year. The adults cannot survive the cold, but eggs can't. Only in the egg stage can they survive or sometimes in a larval stage in an insulated place. And then they'll attack as soon as it warms up. So that's why we want to be ready for them now. The sooner the better. Sometimes being several months in advance is very helpful. So uh, among the first things to come out are actually going to be the peach tree borer. Who has peach tree? Anybody? Well, we've got a few hands. We've got uh, peach trees, apricot, plum, uh, and uh, neck rings. If any of you have any of those, you are susceptible to peach tree borer. Very, very common in this area. They tend to show their most obvious symptoms in January. But that's what's happening is that right now, they are, uh, the, uh, the adult borers are actually, they're, they're weak right now. They're not in the trees, but they're laying their eggs right now. And they've been doing so for some time. They lay the eggs down low on the bark, sometimes under the soil. And then the, the eggs hatch out, and then the boar hatch, uh, gets into the, they, they go below the soil and burrow under the bark and get under there. And then you start seeing something in January. You, you look at it, you, you see these globs. Uh, looks like a mixture of tree sap and, and uh, sawdust and dirt. Some of you may have seen those, usually at the base of the tree. That's because it's been overwintering down there, and now that it's, we've had our first warm spell, it usually comes somewhere in eh, January, February, you get that first warm spell, not real warm, but just enough so that in their insulated place under the bark, they can feel, well, oh, I'm, I'm not too cold to wake up and start moving around and eating, and then they start feeding, and that's when you start seeing that, uh, that sap and that, that sawdust coming out, and it just looks like logs, globs of junk. I've actually got a, a picture. Our color printer was out of ink, I'm sorry. I did try to print out some pictures of some of the things that we're going to be talking about, just some of them, especially things where you kind of need a, a visual. Huh? I think I left it in the printer. Pinion pine? Yes. There is a board that gets into the pinion pine, yes. So we're going to talk about both of them. And it happens at the same time of year. 
So again, they start off either on the bark or in the ground during the winter in order to stay warm. And then in, say, January, February, that's when they hatch out and they start feeding on the tree. They get under the bark and start feeding at the vascular system. So, for example, here in, in Prescott, uh, the pinion pines and a lot of the other evergreens, they do suffer from the flathead dwarf. Very, very common. Very tiny insect. You won't really notice it when you see it around, but it's going to do a lot of damage if left unchecked. So basically, it's under the bark where you don't see it feeding on that vascular system, and then you're seeing branches dying off. You're seeing stress. You're seeing needles turn, turning brown in the case of the, uh, the flathead boar. In the case of the peach tree, you don't see a whole lot at first. The damage is minimal at first. But year after year, it starts to build up. All of a sudden, whole branches are, are dying off. Generally, within the first couple of years, you're, you're seeing parts of branches dying off and you don't know what's going on. Whole branches start falling off by year you know, three, three and four, that's when really severe damage starts to happen. Large branches are coming off. The tree as a whole is in danger. So it takes a while for it to, to, to build up as far as the peach tree borer goes. Uh, even with the flathead borer, the first year you're seeing stress. You're definitely seeing stress. You don't know what's going on. Second year, you really start to get scared. Evergreens, they don't bounce back quite as easily as deciduous trees sometimes. So you're seeing this. So again, you want to be aware of it. Thank you. Alright. <laughs> uh, so there's different ways to handle this. If the, if the insect is already under the bark, well, obviously you can't spray it, can you? I mean, it's under the bark, it, the spray can't reach it. It's protected. There's a couple of ways to approach that. If it's something, a situation where you can, you can use a systemic in insecticide. This is something that you would pour into the roots. You would actually mix this with water, pour it around the base of the tree, it goes into the soil, and the tree absorbs it, and the tree itself actually becomes toxic. So in some situations, this may be right for you. What can happen, you, you, it's just one of these things, you, you need to understand how it works. It gets into the tree's vascular system, it enters the, the branches, the twigs, the leaves, or needles. It also enters into the flower. You want to be aware of when you're using it. Is it about the flower? It may not be the best time to be using it right now. So it's something you need to be aware of how it works. Now, in the case of pit fruit, and also certain other fruits, it doesn't get into the fruit. The fruit actually has a filter that prevents toxins from getting into it. But there's nothing to prevent it from getting into the flower's nectar. So we're now we're thinking birds, bees, butterflies. We have to think about those guys. So when you're dealing with, say, peach tree borer, you have to be thinking about when it's flowering. Is that what you for the pine trees as well? Yes, in the case of the pine trees, this is something that uh, is a favorite product for a lot of people because, let's face it, most of the time the pine tree is just too tall to spray, and in the case of the boar, you can't spray. It's, it's not an option. But there is another way to go about this. If you're prepared for it, remember that a lot of these things are starting in the soil before they enter the tree. That means if you catch them in time, you can actually kill them before they've entered the tree. So that's another way you can go about it. So using uh, herbicide in the fall will actually help uh, in the fall or winter, depending on how the weather is playing out. You don't want to do it when the ground is frozen, but you do want to make sure you do it when they are in the soil. But uh, if you use a herbicide in the, in the late fall, or sometimes uh, in the late summer, depending on what you're trying to kill, you can actually kill them before they've even gotten in there. In the case of the, the peach tree borer, they're right under the soil, sometimes already. Uh, let's get, this, get the timeline straight. When they lay the egg, which is summertime, it's on the bark. So you can spray the bark and actually kill the, the eggs before they even hatch, if you can catch it at the right time. It, you don't want to spray just before they've laid them, but you don't want to spray after the, the eggs have already hatched either. It's a little tricky. 
If they've already entered the soil, you may be able to get them with certain types of products. Um, the nematodes that we carry in the spring do kill peach tree borer. Nematodes are microscopic creatures that parasitize peach tree borers and other bad insects. So you can actually come in when we have this in stock. Again, they're alive, so it's a perishable product. We only carry it during the spring and summer. Come in, get the nematodes, and you apply those to the soil and, and the bark. While they are in that stage where they can be reached, the nematodes can also kill them off before it becomes a problem. Before they can enter all the way under the bark and get up high enough where they, the nematodes stop being affected. I find that's a really good way to go, especially when you're not wanting to deal with chemicals and, and, and toxins. The nematodes only kill what they're supposed to kill. They will not harm anything else. They won't harm you or the dog or the earthworm. It only attacks specific creatures, such as the peach tree borer or beetle larva. So that it's very safe to use. You can even put it in your vegetable garden. You can put it on anything you need to, whole landscape, very effective. Put it in your compost pile. If you've got grubs in the compost pile, it'll take care of them. Very safe. Again, because of, of its perishable nature, we do have to only bring it in certain times of the year. It is something that uh, you keep in the fridge for a while until you are ready to use it. Once in the soil, you can generally get approximately several months to a year out of it. Uh, at, once they've killed everything off that they feed on, well, uh, they eventually starve out. So what, you, you get a, you put in an application, it's good for the rest of the season, and the next year you would put in another application is how that would work. In the case of a scale, now this isn't a bur uh, uh, burrowing creature, this is a, a tiny insect, attaches itself to pine needles, uh, Again, right around the same time as the borers do. So this is another one you want to be aware of. Early in the year, be ready for them. They have their eggs laid on the trunk near the base. It kind of looks like this fluffy, uh, kind of a mottled green, salt and pepper, dirt color. <laughs> kind of a funny speckling mottled color, but they're kind of fluffy and they're on the, the, on the top of the bark. You can actually see it. Uh, if you see that, a lot of times people don't catch it. Let's face it, we don't spend that much time in our yards during the winter time. And so we tend to miss a lot of things because of that. And then you go out and you notice something, and it's too late to treat it. it the eggs have already hatched, all we're seeing are the shells. That's what can happen with the scale. Quite often they, we miss them. Sometimes we don't even see the eggs, that they're just not that obvious. We don't even see them at all, even after we've gone out and looked at it. So you start seeing these, uh, uh, again, stress on the tree, dehydration, uh, things, needles turning brown. This is very, very common. The scale is an extremely common insect here. They basically attach themselves like a barnacle to the needles and just start feeding. They, just, they feed and suck the life out of the tree. It, it's funny, but the most damaging insects tend to be the smallest. So something to, to be aware of. They do a lot of damage because they're they're so small, they go unnoticed until the damage is done. So again, something to be aware of. You'll see what looks like little bumps or flecks on the needle. Uh, you don't know what they are, but it's kind of stuck on there. That scale. That is something that you can spray, but again, how big is that tree? The 40 footer? Can you spray something that big? So again, this is when a lot of people will go to the plant protector, the systemic that the tree absorbs, then you know it's getting all the way to the top and all out into all the branches. Yeah, it's got a set of the pine cones on the deck. It's as far as I know. Yeah. Yeah. So it's, again, it's just be aware of it and, and make judgment calls based on what you've got going on in your yard and what kind of wildlife you've got going on in your yard and what you do and don't want to do. So it's all about knowing how it works. Be educated about your products. Okay? It is something that lasts for several months. So most uh, people that use it, they just apply it, say, about February-ish, uh, and then it just lasts for the rest of the year. By the time it starts to, to wear off, we're already in winter when nothing is out there laying eggs or 
causing you problems. So those are just some of the early, early things that we really want to be aware of. Let's see. Next usually comes with brick in the aphids. Again, we saw those hard this year, really hard. Then the spider mite. The thrip and the aphids, now in their case, they actually come out and uh, pretty much from everywhere. A little bit harder to prevent because yes, you can kill the ones in your yard, but there's more all over the place and they just fly in. So this is one of those things where you are going to have to deal with as they arrive. The thrip and the aphid, uh, the thrip are real tiny. I've got a picture here. All right, I want to show you some, some the photos. A little easier than trying to explain it. So generally with thrip, the other name for thrip is noceus. They're really tiny. Most people cannot see them with the naked eye. So what you see is the damage. So this is a, a very close-up of a thrip. You see kind of a long body guy, but like I said, he's about the size of a grain of dirt. So most of you are not going to see them crawling around. Now, sometimes you can take a leaf, slap it on a piece of paper, and the thrip will fall off. And then you take a magnifying glass and look, and you can see things crawling around. Sometimes you can see them that way. So in this case, this is a very common symptom. I just printed out some photos because I thought this would help but make it easier. When they start feeding, the, the leaves will start twisting, bending over, contorting, puckering, cupping. They just start getting really weird looking. So this is a kind of a, a classic damage. You can see the, the main vein of the, the leaf comes up and kind of bends over. It, when the damage, as the damage continues to uh, accumulate, you'll see more of that contorting effect. That's a very common symptom of threat. Again, they tend to come out, they're among the first to come out in the spring when it, it starts to, to fairly warm up. They like cool weather, not too cold, not too hot. They do have a tendency to just go away on their own in the summertime. For most of us, not 100%, but for most of us, they'll go away on their own, come back in the fall, when it cools down again. Uh, this is another picture. This is a daisy with thrip damage. You can see it almost looks as if somebody went and scraped the color right off the petal. You also notice, notice some of the petals are shortened and again contorted. That's from the thrip feeding. They tend to attack flowers while they're still in the bud stage, which is really annoying. It's most noticeable on roses. I know I've got, here we go. I, and I am going to pass these around too. I know it's hard for you to see this. This is a picture of a rosebud. Again, these guys are really tiny. So what they do is they get into a bud just as it's cracking open, and they get squeezed into the little uh, folds between the petals, and they start uh, sucking the juices out of the edges of the petals. And as the bud opens up, it looks as if it's been thin. Like some of the, the petals that will actually look, uh, the edges look uh, dried out, usually almost blackened. And as the rose opens, the thing looks like somebody that took a torch and singed every every petal, especially the ones on the outside. If the damage is really that bad, the blood will not even open it. So these are some examples of, of the kind of damage you may start to see in the springtime. Now with thrip, it's just spray as you see. So you would take a, a product, for example, the multi-purpose insect control, or maybe the the triple action. Well, these are pretty safe for anything, whatever you're spraying. You can put them on your fruit tree and on your vegetables. You take uh, one of these products, you just spray it on everything. Um, when you see the, uh, that the strips there, you spray it. You may even decide to do it on a regular basis because you know they keep coming. Or you might just do it as you see that they are there. That's kind of up to you. Since they're too tiny to see, you're probably just going to have to, if you have tend to have a problem every year, I would say just get into a routine, make it weekly when dealing with aphids and thrips. They do reproduce in amazing, amazing ways, really. If you ever get a chance, you're into this weird science kind of stuff, look up the, the life cycle. 
the, of the annual life cycle of the aphid. I know it's such a common pest, we never think of it, but it's actually kind of amazing the way it changes its biology with the season. Really, really fun thing. They do reproduce asexually, born pregnant, put rodents to shame in the reproduction department. <laughs> they just keep coming. <laughs> So generally, it's one of those, just be out there every week. If you have a problem, you have to be out there every week. If you have, if you want to try to go natural, try to get the ecosystem to take over, it means you have to really hold back. I know it's hard. You have to hold back, restrain yourself from using those, and it's going to take a while for the balance to really catch up. So it's one of those things. You just have to be patient. And remember, this is the most devastating insect. They can do serious damage during real bad years to the leaves. You can see almost all the leaves are, are barely even functioning anymore. And this, on some of the trees I saw this, this spring. But sometimes you can get away with just letting things pick in. But for the most part, you're going to be spraying once a week to keep things under control. And I'm going to go ahead and pass. Those are the sprit pictures. You guys want to just pass those around. The next one I wanted to mention is spider mites. And again, I know you can't see it from here, I will pass these around. Spider mites are even smaller than the brick. They're about half the size, or maybe even a quarter of the size, depending on which one they are. This is a two spotted spider mite, most common in this area. You can see they have a spot on either side of their back. Kind of a rounded body, almost like a, the shape of an aphid, with, with legs kind of like a spider, but not as long. They actually are an arachnid, not an insect, they're an arachnid. So that means that they don't act the same way as insects. And we're going to talk a little bit about why that's important in just a minute. Spider mites are one of the worst things you can have to deal with once you've already got the infestation. They're tough to deal with. They are fairly easy to prevent. You can actually prevent most of your problems by simply using preventative methods. Now they can come in at any time, but what I have found is if I spray everything down with horticultural oil, first thing, say again, February, March, or you can use really any time of fall, winter, you know, before spring really kicks in, I find I don't have issues with spider mites. It actually works very, very well at preventing issues. Nine times out of ten. You can always still get an infestation in the middle of the year, but I find that I am able to deal with whatever comes my way with a lot of preventative maintenance. So that horticultural oil, for those of you who are regulars here, you probably know it's one of my favorite things to push. Horticultural oil, I love it. Doesn't affect any of the beneficial insects, so it's perfectly safe in natural and organic gardens. You can you just spray that down during the dormant season. Do not spray right now. Do not spray when it's hot. It will burn the leaves. It's an oil. The sun will hit it, burn the leaves. You can use it on house plants right now. That's fine. And I definitely use it on house plants. I find horticultural oil to be more effective than anything else. I wish it could be used year round, but it can't. It really is very effective. The problem with a lot of insecticides is they don't work on eggs. The adults and the larvae, they will all die off when you hit them with insecticide. The eggs are often the means to most insecticide. What you have to do, if you've got problems right now with insects, spider mites, whatever, you've got to take an insecticide and spray it every week. You have to keep up. Do not miss a day. Do not miss a week. I see that happen a lot. I know it's really hard to keep up with. You have to do it. What you're really trying to do is kill this generation, then the eggs are going to hatch out, now you've got more, you have to kill them quick before they lay more eggs and start the next one. And so you spray this every week for several weeks and finally get them under control that way. One application will not work, not on spider mites, not on a lot of other insects. You must put in a, a weekly application in order to get them all gone before you really catch up with them. You have to be very careful here at the garden center. We literally have thousands of plants to look after. And they're all sitting out here in the sun, enjoying the weather, and insects could fly in at any time and get into them. So we have to really watch our plants to make sure nothing is, is harming them. 
and we have to keep up on them. Being vigilant and knowing what can attack before it does can go a very long way in preventing problems and, and preventing uh, infestations or keeping them from getting out of control. Uh, Cheryl is our uh, official annihilator. She does a lot of the pest killing for us. Uh, a lot of the spraying. We try to use uh, natural products as much as possible here. Just because we don't want to. It's good. It's good for our hands. It's good for you. It's good for the environment. We want to. So, what I have found is that if you're going to be using natural products, being aware of what you're going to be dealing with in the future really goes along with it. So, yeah, that horticultural oil, like I like I mentioned, it's not something you can use now, unless it's going to be something that stays in the shade. But if you just make it a habit of spray in, say, again, February, March, before things come out of dormancy, I find it's very easy to spray things down when they have no leaves. You can use a lot of evergreens too, but just make sure you get full coverage. So try not to miss any of the nooks or crannies. And the great thing about it is you spray once, just once, and you're done. And after that, you only have to deal with things that fly in afterwards. And I find that most of the time, there's a lot of things I can avoid altogether just with that one annual application. So it really goes a long way. Okay, I want to pass these. These are showing some of the symptoms. This is spider mites. This is the symptoms of the spider mite. You'll notice, uh, again, you can't see them, they're too small. This, you'll notice a sort of discoloration. The plants tend to look kind of, their color isn't right. They look mottled, speckled, depending on how bad the damage is. You may see webbing sometimes. They also have a tendency to look dirty. Uh, again, sorry, I couldn't get those in color, but I do have some, as uh, some of you have brought in samples of your trees at home for us to diagnose. These have had everything on them killed, so don't worry, you're not going to be spreading things. <laughs> but uh, here's some examples. This one's severe, this is severe discoloration on that one. This one's not quite as severe, but needs to be treated right away or actually has. Uh, so these are examples of spider mite damage. Again, we've already killed everything on them, we put them under the microscope, looked at them very closely to make sure nothing's crawling around. Some of them, you see this one actually started to cut from the damage because they're feeding on it. The damage is very light, but it did start to cut a little bit. So again, like I said, we want to talk a lot about preventative maintenance. You notice I have a, a, some herbs and flowers up here. That's because a lot of herbs and flowers can actually be used to repel insects in the first place. So for example, marigolds are good at repelling a lot of pests, including mosquitoes. You got a problem with mosquitoes, you got a pond, any kind of water feature, irrigation that comes on a lot. Um, you live near a creek, a lot of us do. Uh, marigolds actually will repel mosquitoes along with other insects. Herbs repel insects in general. There's always a few exceptions to the rule that they do repel. So you, I can use these to prevent the need for insecticides in the first place. So let's say, for example, I just brought this up as an example. This is bok choy. So let's say I want to protect this guy. I don't want things feeding on him. This guy's going to be susceptible to, well, pretty much everything. Uh, all kinds of insects. Spider mites, um, thrip, but most especially cabbage moth. That's the one I'm really going to be dealing with when putting in any member of the cabbage family. I'm going to be dealing with cabbage moth. So if I were to plant this with near my kind, for example, that's going to repel the cabbage moth. I can't stand this stuff. I can even take this. Let's say uh, I don't have the time to plant it right next to it. I can actually take some of this time and kind of grind it up and put it in some water and then spray it right on top of the, the bok choy to prevent the cabbage moth. They're going into our fall planting season for fall vegetables. 
So it's good to know, let's face it, the fall vegetables is mostly green leafy stuff and, and, and root vegetables. And so they're very susceptible to insects. At least when an insect attacks, say, your squash plant, well, it did damage the leaves, but you weren't going to be eating the leaves. You just needed the plant to stay alive long enough to, you know, <laughs> get some fruit off of it. If they start eating these leaves, what am I left with to eat? So I need to protect my bok choy, my cabbage, my broccoli, Brussels sprouts and, and the like. I gotta protect these. I gotta, I gotta make sure that there's no damage, even minimal damage, uh, can make my, my food unappetizing in this case. So planting herbs with them will go a very long way. Whether you want to put the herbs into a pot and just set them uh, in among the, the crops or actually plant them together, that's up to you. Mint is a very, very good one for repelling insects. Very excellent. Insects and animals, though, they can't take it. It's just too pungent. Anything that's real pungent tends to have a repelling effect. And mint is very, very effective. It can, however, take over. So not everybody wants to plant it right into the ground or the race bed. So sometimes I'll just put it into a pot and place pots of herbs in among the crops, and that's easier. The more of it, the better. Now, the one thing I do have to warn you about, spider mites, again, they're not insects. They're arachnids. They're related to spiders. They're not going to act the same way. They don't mind the herbs so much as insects. So that's something you still need to be aware of. Just be vigilant. If you're, if you're seeing symptoms, you very easily could be them. But a lot of, like I said, a lot of things can be prevented by simply putting it in annual maintenance, cleaning away dead stuff and taking it away. Uh, if you suspect that there were any insects or eggs uh, lodging in there, at the, uh, in the winter, just you know, make sure to clean it all up. Dead stuff needs to be cut away and thrown out. And then spraying what's left down with that horticultural oil. It's going to go a very, very long way in preventing them. Now, I brought this up. Oh, I forgot to read the ladybug. I always get, uh, every spring, we, we get people coming in saying, what's attacking? <laughs> And sometimes it's not actually a bad thing. This right here, some of you may have seen this. Does it ever look like someone took a hole punch to some of your leaves? Especially a uh, purple rose locust and um, roses. Do you have roses? Actually, this is a beneficial insect, and the damage is not going to do any real harm to the plant. So this is a non-stinging bee. They do not live in hives. They do not live in colonies. They are solitary bees and therefore have no need to sting because they have no colony to die for. And so what they do is they, they cut little notches out of the out of the leaves and then they take them for nesting because each bee has its own little nest. So it's just going to take a few circles, it's not going to harm the plant. We'll see these leaves later in fall still sitting there, even though they've had the notches cut out, they still are there, still green and healthy. So you can see it doesn't do any damage to the plant, you don't have to worry about that. Another one that I forgot to bring up here was the ladybug larva. Uh, that one, it, a, a lot of you have uh, internet access. Just Google ladybug larva real quick so you know what they look like. Very useful to know. When you see it, you're going to panic and think, oh my gosh, it's killing my garden. It's not. <laughs> it's actually a good guy. So those are things that are good to, to look up. The other one would be lacewing eggs. You get a lot of those sometimes. So again, you know, we're, we're not wanting to harm our beneficials, so that's again why it's good to use preventative maintenance because when you're using less insecticides in the long run, you're allowing the beneficials to restore balance to the garden, and then you find you'll have less need for insecticides in the first place. I can't even remember the last time I actually had to spray anything besides horticultural oil. I think it's been four years since I sprayed anything besides horticultural oil. The balance is as restored. The only thing I have to deal with are the grasshoppers. They got bad this year. Uh, things are still okay, but they're doing more damage than I would like. <laughs> so, um, so when do you spray the horticultural oil in the fall? Yeah, you can spray horticultural oil in the fall, spring, uh, basically when it's not hot. If it's hot, you will go out and you will see your leaves of burn <laughs> to a crisp. <laughs> 
good. As long as it's nice and cool, it's fine. Um, so you don't want to go any higher than say 70 ish. So try not to push it too much. House plants, anytime. House plants are not immune. I know we think that because they're indoors, nothing can get to them. How things get into the house sometimes we just can't figure out. And yet your house plants will show up with spider mites, they'll show up with thrip and aphids sometimes. Another one that's really common on house plants are mealy bugs. Mealy bug and spider mites seem to be the two that get into house plants the most. And they're tough to deal with, <laughs> to be perfectly honest. And nothing works better on them than horticultural oil. Well, that's something that's just good to keep around for everything. Yes. Catalpa trees? Yeah, if something's attacking your catalpa, um, I would say you can't use the horticultural oil during the warm season, but you definitely you could spray that on uh, during the dormant season when it has no leaves and spray them on. Works very well. It really prevents so much that way. Uh, let's see. What have we covered? We have covered. Oh, um, gophers. <laughs> gophers, let's start with soil dwelling insects. And then we'll, that kind of transitions into gopher. The soil uh, dwellers, mostly here's a big problem we have with our gloves. So go out and you'll notice that your plants, trees, grasses, whatever, are just drying up. This is classic sign of dehydration and you don't know why. You know it's getting enough water and yet it seems to be dehydrating. Wilting, browning, turning to a crisp. What's wrong here? It's usually grubs. They're feeding on the roots, and now the plant doesn't have enough roots to take up water, and it's dying of dehydration. The grubs are in the soil. They're beetle larvae, most of them. Various types of beetles lay their eggs in the soil, usually in late summer, around monsoon, after that first rain. So basically, the ground is hardened on, on, on the top, okay, because it's been baking the sun all summer. So it's hard. You get that first rain, and now it's softened up. After a rain or two, it's softened up. Now things can start to happen. This is this is that time when a lot of the grubs hatch out of the soil, become full-fledged beetles. At this stage, they're harmless when they're adults. They just kind of crawl around, and you wonder why there's beetles all over the place. And all they really do—they don't live for very long. They just uh, look for mates. They, they lay eggs in the soil. Again, they've got to be able to dig into the soil to lay the eggs. So they're looking for soft soil. So that's why a lot of them come out during the rainy season. So they, they can dig in and lay those eggs. And then once the eggs hatch, then the, the grubs burrow in looking for roots. The, the mother beetles are always going to look for places where the soil is, is moist and where there are plants nearby. So those places where you have a tree or a shrub or something, you've got wheat cloth coming up to it, but there's a space in there under the, the branches that is exposed and it's being regularly irrigated. And sometimes uh, these beetles will even come out early because of it. And so you, this can happen any time during the summer, but you'll see most of it happening during monsoon. They've just gotten into that cycle. They're going to hatch around the same time that they were laid. So most of them are going to come out that time of year, and you'll see just dehydration for no reason. There's a, again a couple different grubicides. Now this one we carry year round. This one, uh, this one is a is a pesticide. It's a granular that you put on the ground and water in, and it seeps down and kills those grubs. The other one that we hit, I mentioned earlier, is the nematode. It kills grubs. That was the natural one that you can use around vegetables and so on, but it's only available during spring and even summer. We don't have it right now, so uh, I would say give us a call say April. Usually it's about when it comes in. Now, another thing that can do the exact same thing, gophers. Before we get into gophers, uh, what other kind of insects are we going to be dealing with in this group? There's so many to cover. I, I kind of want to make sure we're getting the things. We mentioned grape leaf skeleton. The skeletonizer is another thing they get on grape leaf. Anything else? Ah, centipede. 
Tomato worms. Ooh. Yeah. Okay, so let's uh, let's start with the worm, and we'll also talk bag worms because it's that time of year, and also blister beetle because again that time of year. So the great leaf skeletonizer is a teeny little caterpillar that usually comes out of mass, and they chew away at the, the leaves on the great leaves, and sometimes they'll leave uh, the veins behind, and it starts to look like a skeleton. So you'll you'll see those. A uh, spittle bug is another one that's common on grape leaves. Uh, usually what you see isn't so much the bug itself, you'll see what looks like spit. It looks like somebody spit on the plant. It, it's actually the, 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 a tiny, tiny little bug who's uh, on the, the skin. And he's making this goop <laughs> that looks like spit. And he's making this goop to protect himself from, from predators, and especially to protect it's eggs from predators. I mean, nothing wants to explore that goop to see if there's anything tasty underneath, right? <laughs> so you'll see that on uh, great, uh, great vines most often, and sometimes you'll see them on rosemary or sage. Hardly anything gets on rosemary or sage, but when it does, it's usually that spittle bug. Even then, it's rare. The other one that would be something to watch out for would be the ground the hornworm. Again, we're, we're talking about another kind of caterpillar. They're just going to start chomping away at least until there's nothing left. They get huge. They start off small and they grow and they grow and they grow until they're about the size of a sausage. They're huge. And then finally, <laughs> they, they finally turn into the sphinx moth, also called the hummingbird moth. And many of you have seen it didn't realize what it was. Did you notice a, a daytime moth? Come out during the daytime instead of the, uh, just at night. It comes out during the daytime. You can tell it's definitely a, a moth, not a butterfly. It's not all colorful, but it hovers while it feeds, which is unusual. And so it it's often mistaken for a brown hummingbird until you get up close and realize it's a big fat moth. <laughs> it's about the size of a large hummingbird. So it's called a sphinx moth, or if you say hummingbird moth, people know what you're talking about. That's the hornworm. I know it looks really neat when you see it hovering in front of the flowers, feeding like that, until you realize in the larval stage it causes a lot of trouble. So it's not something you want to encourage around your tomatoes. So if you see those moths around uh, your garden in the summer, you know, do something quick. They're laying eggs. That's what they're really doing. They're causing trouble. The cabbage moth, again, uh, that one tends to look very innocent. It's white. Small, white, very common. You don't even think about it when you see it. Again, that's the one that gets on your cabbages and broccoli and bok choy and all that. Very innocent looking until you realize what it is. The, uh, the bagworm was the other one I, I mentioned. Bagworm has a tendency to come out, I think about August. Now this year it didn't seem to be real bad, but you'll go outside and all of a sudden, there's these fuzzy caterpillars everywhere. <laughs> Sometimes they're, they're swarming all over a bush or a tree. Sometimes they're just all over the yard and you don't know what's going on. So all three of these things that we're mentioning are all caterpillars, right? So you can go out with a, a regular insecticide, like a multi-purpose, or you can also go out and again, this is something you want to be aware of how it, how it works. This works on all caterpillars. So don't put this in monarch garden. This is uh, a bacteria that only affects caterpillars and not other insects. So it won't affect, say, your ladybug, great mantis. Awesome. It won't affect your beneficial wasps. Great. But it's very effective on uh, any kind of caterpillar. It's uh, called Bacillus thuringiensis. Well, BT. So that's something to consider. Again, be aware of how it works. Because of the fact that it's alive, um, it can just die out in the sun after a while. So I would say wait until you see them. If it's the type of insect that has eggs that early, yeah, just use the horticultural oil. If it's still cool enough for that. If it's something 
that you have to wait uh, until it's warmer, then you need to use the ATU and the multipurpose will work. This is also effective for bud worm. Bud worm is that little, it will start off green, but it changes color after a while. So it's a little caterpillar. It starts off real tiny. It tends to attack petunia and geraniums. It eats its way into the, the flower bud before it's open, eats away all the petals, and then when it opens, there's no petals. You're wondering what's going to happen there. Or sometimes you'll see petals, but there's big holes in it. That's blood worm. The blood worms, they're, they're there right in front of you, but they're well camouflaged, hard to see. Problem is, when you try to spray them, they're inside the bud, where the spray doesn't reach. So again, you're, you're dealing with issues. So having something with a lingering effect it, it tends to be more effective. Again, spray every week because you spray it, you didn't get con direct contact with it, you gotta wait for it to come out. So you're having to just make sure you spray on a weekly basis so that you make sure you're, you're, you're taking every opportunity to get them on their way in or their way out. This is another one of those things where people come in and say to me, I tried spraying and it didn't work. They're still there. And the problem is, Frequency uh, is, is key to these types of insects. It's not just spray once and you're done. You have to keep up on it. Again, know your products, whether you're using uh, the BT or the multipurpose. Let's see, any other insects we want to cover before we move on to animals? Oh, I got stories to tell you about animals. <laughs> gophers. Again, gophers. I forgot to bring it up here. The gophers, we're not going to get, if Ken were up here, he would just go and tell you stories. <laughs> he is the king when it comes to killing gophers. So I'm going to give you a few pointers. Again, let's talk preventative maintenance or, shall I say, uh, more effortless maintenance. Mm -hmm. What they're doing is they're yeah. Yeah. A gopher will suddenly decide that it's going to remove a tree. They'll do this. They just decide, I'm going to remove this whole tree. And they will eat away at the entire root system. And then the tree just falls over and there's not a single root left. This does happen. I don't know why they do this. But you'll know when they do it. You'll see the mound, you'll see the holes encroaching on the tree, act fast. Do not let them get anywhere near. Again, like the grubs are feeding on the roots and then there's just no roots to support the tree. And like I said, they won't stop until there's literally nothing left. Luckily, there is a product that we have found that really seems to be especially effective on dealing with gophers. Now, as far as killing gophers, there's a few different ways to go about it. You can use traps or you can use bait. Yes, they make smoke bombs. I'm going to tell you right now, they don't really work that well. Somehow, the, the smoke always finds some aperture somewhere where it can escape instead of being trapped in the tunnel system, and so it doesn't work. If you think you can seal everything, you can give it a shot, but it's not consistent. You'll never get consistent results with smoke bombs. We do sell them in case you want to try them, but like I said, we will not promise you any consistency with that. The traps and baits, they're effective, but again, this is not one of those things where you apply once and you're done. You have to be super diligent, you have to be out there every weekend, reapplying the bait, resetting the traps, moving the traps, you have to be on this. What I tell people is that we, the best thing to do is just to repel them instead. You get a lot more effect and a lot less time. We sell a product called Molmax. You see it, it's a, a yellow bag about this big. I think it's about six pounds or something like that. It's a granular uh, castor oil is what it is. So it smells. It's not toxic, it's just smelly. So basically imagine that you take a, a stink bomb and you throw it in somebody's house. What are they going to do? They're going to vacate, right? That's the idea of what the Molmax. You can use it on any kind of burrowing animal. You sprinkle it on the ground generously, water it in, it actually soaks in and makes the dirt, it makes the tunnels smell so bad that they have to leave. They can't take it, they've got to get out of there. If you put that on, on the soil, 
and they just run for the hills. So if you have a dog and they will well, not hurt you. It's something that, yeah, you're gonna you're, you smell it at first, but it's gonna soak into the ground. And so once it's down in there, then it's down. Yeah, I know that in every hole. Actually, it's something you're going to broadcast evenly over the soil. Remember, the hole is nothing but an exit point for the dirt while they're burrowing. Yeah, that's good. Yeah. So what I recommend is that you choose the area you want to protect. Now, there's different ways to do this. You can say put it around each tree and and just protect the trees. If you want to get them out of your yard, maybe not the whole acreage, because usually if you have gophers, you probably have acreage as well. It's probably in Chino or Paulden or Pusca Valley. You can't always, it's just not practical to do, say, two and a half acres, seven acres, 40 acres, it's not practical. But you can at least protect the area you want to keep them out of, say, your main yard, around the house, around your garden, your landscape. Do those areas. What I recommend is you start at a central point. It might be the house, it might be the trees, the garden, whatever. You start there and you put a, a nice wide band around it or even in it. And then you, you drive them out of that area and then you, you broadcast another band outside of that and drive them out even further. And you keep doing that until they're as far as you want them to be. Drive them out to wherever. Out of the woods, out of the fields, where they belong. The neighbor's house. Yeah. Where? Well, don't care as long as it's not here. Drive them out, and then just, uh, you may have to, some people have to apply on a regular basis because as soon as they stop, the gophers start coming right back in. Remember, gophers, they have no qualms about entering a tunnel that they didn't build. If they see that there's free open tunnel, they will step right in. I, it's just how it is. If you kill a gopher, don't just assume, okay, that mound is no longer active. No, it simply means that this gopher over here says, oh look, free tunnels, let's step, step right over his buddy's body and take over the nest, okay? So never assume that just because he's gone, that that place is permanently vacant. You've got to keep them out. Some people have found that they can just kind of watch things, and if it looks like they're trying to come back again, then they go ahead and broadcast again. I've had people tell me I got to do it every two months. I've had other people say, oh, once a year is fine. You know, everybody's different. So, is it okay to put it in the well where the water well is in the tree, or do you have to it? You can put it anywhere. You can put it in the water well in the tree. Fine. Yeah. So, yeah, if they're already in there, then you have to put it where they are. Right. Yes, and that's going to happen when you have a gopher cage. I mean, the gopher cage, as big as might be this big, and so the, the roots need to grow beyond that. So basically, this is sort of, uh, think of a gopher cage as more temporary protection until you can come up with something better. So it, it, it's immediate, but it's not long term. It's not going to hurt dogs. Not going to hurt the dogs. If they roll in it right after you apply it, they might come in a little smelly. <laughs> but it's not going to hurt anything. It's not meant to hurt anything. It is literally a stink bomb for gopher tunnels. Is the name of that stuff again? Mole Max. It's right down there on Mole Max. Yes. So for anything that's burrowing, that, that includes rabbits, ground squirrels, you know, anything that's under the ground, you can apply this stuff. Uh, skunks, yeah, if you want to apply it to keep them from digging, absolutely. Uh, anything that's going to be digging in the soil, you can use it for them. The javelina included, yes. Um, not the ants. Huh? I don't know. I, I've never thought about using castor oil on ants. That's something to uh, look into. But we do have stuff that's really effective on ants. Uh, we have, uh, if it's say like little black ants, we have, it's a two that's small, but boy, is it effective. Those will take care of those. If it's fire ants, we have something specifically for fire ants. They don't feed like other ants. So you need a, a base specifically for them. When dealing with fire ants, something i got to tell you, you're going to apply the bait, all of a sudden they're going to disappear, and you're going to think, oh, great, and you're going to walk away and forget about them. Don't do that. Watch it, because what's going to happen is they take the baits, 
back to their colony and they're putting it in their foodstuffs and they're they're feeding it to the colony, they're feeding it to the queen, the queen dies off, and you know, once, once the queen dies off, the, the colony can't survive without a queen. That's the great thing about states, that they can actually pick up and take with them rather than stuff that they have to just consume or come into contact with. So you want baits that they can pick up and take back to the queen. However, some ants like fire ants, what they will actually do is as soon as the queen dies, they realize, oh, we gotta do something quick. They've got larvae at all times. So they're gonna they're gonna take one of those larvae and they're gonna feed it the special stuff and they're gonna train it to be the new queen. And they're gonna get a new queen and, and on, on the throne as quick as, as they can to save the colony. So watch and you're going to see activity again and you're going to put down the bait the second time it can't come back after the, the second time they, they only get that, that second chance they don't get a third they can't recover after that so you have to be ready to apply it a second time once you've got them a second time you're fine okay all right let's talk Catalina <laughs> Now I know we're, we're getting real cramped on time, like I said, we had a lot of information to pack in this class, so uh, I'm going to kind of go over some basics that are going to be really helpful, and then uh, you're welcome to come in and ask questions about your specific uh, issues, because we don't want to keep everyone here all day. Like I said, this is a very information-packed class. So we have Lena, deer, rabbit, uh, those are the three most common that we tend to deal with, and also birds grapes, fruit trees, the birds are going to be after those. Right now everything's fruiting, everything's in harvest period. That means the birds are attacking your fruit, so you definitely need to be ready for them. There's different ways to deal with them. Most of it is physical stuff rather than chemicals and sprays and repellents. Mostly it could be bird netting, it could be streamers, it could be reflective things that flap in the wind. What I have to tell you though, is uh, every year you need to remember, don't put it on too soon. Although some people will, will start putting on their, their streamers and their uh, scare tactics and spraying. Don't do that. The birds get used to it after a while. So put it on right when you know they're going to start pecking at your fruit. That's when you put on streamers, that flap in the wind and scare the birds away. That's when you put a, you know, some of you put up C CDs or pie tins. And I've seen pretty much anything and everything with reflective views. That's fine. Whatever you're using, though, wait for the last minute to put it up. As soon as you're done harvesting, pull them back down. Do not give them time to get used to those. You can also use bird netting. You can just put it right over whatever you're trying to protect so they can't get into it. Physical barriers are great. Yes? What about cicadas? Cicadas. Yeah, the cicadas don't really do any damage, but they're noisy. If they're bugging you, you can spray them, I suppose, but um, that's, that's about it. Um, when they're making noise like this, they're making the noise with uh, their bodies. It's not coming from their mouth. They actually don't have a mouth in this period, in this stage of their life. They have no mouth. Uh, once they have reached the last stage of their life, they mate, they lay eggs, they die. That's it. That's all they live for. They don't have a mouth. They don't feed. So they're not going to attack anything. They're, they're just going to sit around making a whole lot of noise. So, I mean, if they're bugging you, you know, you could spray like multi-purpose or something, but that's about, that's about it. All right. Like I said, let's do a quick over for animals. Again, preventative. Be as proactive as you can in prevention. Plant things they don't like to eat, protect things that they do. Physical barriers are going to be your best long-term solution when protecting, say, the vegetable garden. So putting up, say, fencing around the yard, putting up hardware cloth around the raised bed, uh, chicken wire, you know, if it's rabbits you're dealing with, you're going to have to go with hardware cloth. It has a smaller pole than chicken wire, because the, a lot of the rodents can fit through the chicken wire, depending on what you're dealing with. Physical barriers are going to go a long, long way. I, like many of you, have areas where I don't have fence and I can't fence them in. It's not going to happen. My main thing is how to lead them. Uh, goodness gracious, they are, they say they're smarter than dogs. 
And I gotta tell you, the way that they think will sometimes remind you of humans. They can actually be downright ornery. <laughs> Uh, I, last year they just tried to declare war on me. They, I mean, we've been at it for years. So basically what ends up happening with these guys, anything that you can eat, they'll eat it. Anything else, they'll dig it out so they can root around the grass. They love grass. So they'll do that. They'll try to pull things out so that they can fit under the roof. So things, uh, I can tell you, 99% of my problems with Pavlina, I've been able to avoid simply by planting the right things, and remember not to water or plant at the end of the day. They are attracted to the smell of freshly wetted or freshly disturbed soil, and most of the time they come out at night. So, if they come out in the evening and they, ooh, somebody's been watering, it's like a beacon that attracts them, they are going to come and they're going to dig. dig. They just have to do it, they cannot help themselves. If they smell freshly wetted soil, they will dig. So my recommendation, water in the morning, early in the morning, and that way the surface of the soil has time to dry out, form a crop, move that freshly disturbed smell uh, by the time the have to come around. It will also help you to do, uh, defend against fungus because if you water at night, you do have a tendency to get more mildew black spot that way. You'll see a lot more of it. You'd be surprised how fast it comes on to you start watering at night. So that right there is a huge, huge help. Now, honestly, I, I end up doing most of my planting in the evening it, or in late afternoon. I just can't help it. That's just the convenient time for me. But I know I'm disturbing the soil and I know it's going to attract them. So in my case, what I do is I put down a repellent. Uh, again, kind of similar to the Molnac, it's just something that smells really pungent. Uh, something that, uh, we have, we carry three different kinds down there. It's something that just smells bad or smells, you know, animals are very, very, um, uh, sensitive to any kind of pungent smell. So spraying a repellent, uh, I had some leftover perfume that somebody had given me. I sprayed that. I used all that up. Don't spray it directly on the plant because all the alcohols and chemicals in the perfume could burn the plant. But I sprayed it on uh, the walkways and the stones and the rocks that were in the airway. Um, it's above ground, so it's not going to do anything for gophers. That's where, why you would want the Molnax because it's made to actually soak in and get down underground. But for above ground, if you're dealing with any kind of uh, animal, whether it be rabbits, go, uh, uh, tabulina, deer, repellents will work on them. It's something that I want to tell you, don't try to get too dependent on it. Here's what happens. <laughs> uh, I was up early one morning, I was sitting around, looking out the window at my garden, enjoying the colors, sun barely coming up, it's, it's twilight. The sun, sun wasn't even up yet. And all of a sudden, I see this, this male Pavlina run up to the bed and start digging. Now, I could tell exactly what he was doing. He should have been, I wish I had this on a video, okay? He ran up, he put his nose in there, which is unusual because they really didn't have their nose down. Yeah, my mic is off. Uh oh, is my mic off? This is right here. My mic off. Okay. There we go. Could be. I'll, I'll try to talk louder, okay? Because I, I have no way of uh, troubleshooting. I'll get a little closer to. So basically what he did, he came in, kept his nose up in the air. Normally they have their nose down because they don't have good eyesight. They're very dependent on their noses and their ability to smell their way around. They follow their own scent trails to follow their roots every night. They, they follow smells to find things that they want. So they, they depend on their noses. So it's not normal to see a javelina with his nose up in the air. But this guy had his nose up in the air the whole time. He ran up and started doing this. <laughs> and he actually was scraping the top of the soil, not digging the hole, but actually scraping the top of the soil and kicking it out behind him as if he was trying to scrape the repellent away. And, and try to get rid of it so that he could get to what he wanted. So they're not kidding when they say these guys are actually smarter than dogs. They will figure things out. 
So you want to try to go for permanent solutions as often as you possibly can. So fencing is a great way to go. Uh, again, hardware cloths. It could even be plastic netting. Whatever, whatever keeps them out, you, you, you need to try to use physical barriers to stop them. What I ended up doing, I took pieces of old bamboo stakes, cut them about that long, and I hammered them into the soil. So when he tried to dig, he found something embedded there that prevented him from being able to dig. That's what I did. That was my solution. So things like that can go a long way. So I just put those in between each of the plants and well, it was just too hard for him to dig anymore. I've also been known to scrape away a couple inches of soil and put netting underneath the soil and then put soil back over it and then make sure to, to stake it down so that it, it doesn't tear up again when they try to dig and it, it works. It actually works. What's going to happen, and we're seeing it right now, we've been seeing it for the past few weeks, during times of drought, during hot, dry seasons, you're going to notice that they start getting very um, persistent. The, the things that normally work will start failing. They'll start getting smarter, they'll start getting so picky, they'll start eating plants that they don't normally eat because they have no choice. You remember what Patty used to say, if you weren't stranded out in the desert long enough, you'd eat a bug. You wouldn't think to do it now, but get stranded out in the desert for a while, you would, you'd eat a bug. Kind of the same way with the deer and javelina, that's where we are right now. So right now, uh, it, this year actually has not been as bad as other years. But during the past few weeks, I've had some people, not many, but some, have come in and say, uh, they got into something they weren't supposed to. So normally that plant was repellent. 99% of the time it's repellent or, or uh, undesirable to, the, plant, to the, the animal. But this is what happened. If you're having one of those seasons, again, you can use those repellents. Now those are sprayed on repellents, but not all of them have to be necessarily that type. Buy herbs. They don't like them any more than the insects do. So things like thyme, oregano, definitely mint, very pungent. You can use this. Uh, plant them, planting it around your, your plants will give them some protection. All right. Deer. Deer. Again, deer. Yes. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, there's a, a, a lot of people down there. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, I know we're running into overtime. Like I said, this is, I think we had a scheduling mishap or something. <laughs> so anyway, uh, deer. We were talking deer, and I know some of you also have deer. Again, this is going to come down to planting the things that they don't like, the physical barriers. At least with the deer, you're not dealing with the whole digging thing, soils and, and disturbing soils and things like that. It's mainly going to come down to they're either after food or they're after moisture. Some people have even been able to fix some of their, their deer problems simply by putting out water. If they can at least quench their thirst that way, sometimes they're less likely to go for plants that they'd really rather not have to eat uh, if they didn't have to. This, the squirrels and rabbits will do the same thing. Sometimes they'll go after a plant just for the saps. That, that come out, you'll notice that they'll cut off a, a twig. They don't eat it, but they'll cut it off and then just lift the sap that seeps out of it. So sometimes it's a simple matter of just giving them what they're really after. What flowers don't deer like? So when it comes to things that the animals don't like, anything that has a pungent smell, that would be herbs and cooking, things like lantanas and sagings. Oh, they love our land. Yeah. <laughs> They don't love them, but they'll eat it if they have to. Well, they are eating yeah. crazy, and they're teaching their little fawns, too. Yeah, and that's the problem <laughs> with the deer, is the, the fawns, if they grow up on something, now your neighborhood has a permanent problem. I have seen this before. <laughs> Not fun to deal with. Uh, finding the things that they won't eat. Things that are, are drier, have more of a texture, uh, are less likely to be eaten, especially by having to eat it. to cannot take texture, so stuff like this, you see how it's a very textured leaf? Um, this one actually has a, a fairly textured leaf and a, and a smell, both of these do. Uh, 
this is our auto sage. Again, it's got pungent herby smell and taste. Uh, the Galardia kind of has a cherry leaf. Have been a don't mess with that. Uh, beer don't really like it either. I've never had anyone even during drop periods tell me that they went after uh, most of the, the stuff I have on this table. We've got a lot of it down there. I didn't bring everything up. 